Hello everybody, welcome to this how-to tutorial to paint the lava effect on my fossil magnets. Now this particular design is exclusive only to the game in Beaver, so no matter how much you try, you will never be able to get this anywhere else other than me. Unless of course someone copies it, which is then a big no-no and that will involve in lawyers and stuff, but hopefully we'll never get to that. But one thing I don't want to make exclusive is the paint job. Now. As much as I enjoy painting these and I love making sure that people get the quality of work that everybody uh, likes and the stuff that I do, unfortunately I don't have a lot of time to do this. But what I also want to do is to create something that is uh, accessible to people that want to make this sort of thing. So whether you're a young artist or an expert, um, that you can take one of these designs and create your own piece. You know, I, I like that the, uh, the average person can have that creative flair to it. And, uh, and maybe even improve on something that I didn't think was very likeable and you know everyone has their own taste so as much as I like this paint job maybe the next person doesn't and they want to do something slightly different to it so as you can see this is the prototype so this is the variation that uh, took me a while to figure out but there's a lot of um, color tests in this that didn't quite make the mark but after a few more play arounds it uh, became out much more tasteful and uh, judging by James's reaction in his video, I think he also was uh, quite pleasantly surprised by this. So, uh, so yeah. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk you through the processes, types of brushes that you need, the paints that I personally use, but then that's more kind of personal choice, and how much time goes in between each layer. Because there's one thing that I've noticed on people that have been messaging me, they don't quite think about um, how long it takes to, to do these things. And there's certain variations in things where room temperatures um, different there might be some variation in that but there's other variations as well which I'll go into later on so because this is the third time I'm trying to record this um, I'm not gonna be able to start with the primed version unfortunately because I wanted to show you um, what the difference between the prime version and the painted version was but unfortunately we'll have to start with the painted version so prototype down paint job up it's been painted with a, uh, a matte black and it goes all the way around uh, the sculpt, so it goes into all the nooks and crannies, making sure all the primer is uh, sealed away. And this has actually been painted with a uh, spray black, uh, rather than um, a painted black. Um, there are times when the weather's good that I can get, you know, 20 or 30 of these sprayed up all at once, where I might have to do a little bit of retouching up, but not often. And it just makes it a bit easier, so that if there is a bunch of people that have ordered stuff, that I can get them out. But, of course, size being... An issue with the amount I can get out, um, 30 is probably about the absolute limit I can do at a time. So uh, we've had pretty cold weather here, so we've had to been hand painting a lot of them. But we'll start with the paint job. But first of all, because we've already got the black on, we don't need to worry about that. But the next step for this is to use a grey paint and dry brush it on to really make that detail pop. Now, the paints that I use are Humbrol Enamel. It's the paint I've always preferred to use when it comes to model making, but some people may prefer to use other types of paints, maybe for uh, Warhammer or uh, other types of uh, model paint variants. And the brush that I'm using is a long, flat head. You don't want to apply the paint thickly, you want to rub most of it off on the table surface or on scrap piece of paper or something and then you just want to to start with just run the side of the brush over all the nooks and crannies so you want to try and bring out all that sculpted detail and then just to really bring, call it out just use the tip just let it grace over the sculpt and you don't worry too much about getting it mostly covered you you don't want to completely cover it but you don't want there to be too much black either so the, the gray will basically act as the uh, as the uh, the relief make the sculpt pop um, and the other thing you can use as well if you wanted to if you weren't feeling confident with um, 
enamel paints. You can use um, acrylics, artist acrylics, but don't use acrylics that are water activated. So, for example, like um, acrylic paints that require water to add to it for a children's uh, paint set. Don't use that, that won't work. But normal artist acrylics will. So, that's how it should look, if you can actually tell. So the grey, like I say, just hits all the kind of the high points, all the sculpted points, leaving the black at the base to make the darker points. So once you've done that, you can then start painting your skull. Now, you need to dry brush the skull, but you don't use the brush that I've just used, you use a smaller one. Same sort of type, but it's a smaller variation, I'll just show you. So, this is the dry brushing that I did now, and this will be for the dry brushing that I did with now. So as you can see, it's a lot shorter in length, uh, but it's still that flat type. And it tends to be a little bit stiff as well, which is good, because that's what we want. We don't want it to be too flexible. And again, same principle, take a bit of paint on the tip of your brush, just rub it off on the scrap piece of paper, and then what you do is you just slightly drag it over. Now, normally, if this was a fossil painting, what I would do is I would take whatever colour I was using for the base, so for example, uh, black, and I would do a wash of colour rather than dry brush. Because what a wash will do is it will give the mineral textures that would eventually make up the skull for a fossil. But because this is uh, supposed to represent something that's been caught in an active lava flow, you want to give it a charred effect, and in order to do that, you need to whiten the, uh, the skull first, and then, then you can start adding all those char effects. So you don't want to put too much on, because again, you want to keep that detail that's just hidden within the actual sculpt. But what you do want to do is make sure you get it all over the skull. Of course not forgetting the teeth. If your brush starts drying out, just dump a bit more in. And another, another crack. Now, one thing I will mention as well, the uh, because this is enamel, you can't use water to thin the paint or to clean the brush. You need to use something stronger, and ideally, you want to use something that's more kind of spirit-based as opposed to H2O. So I personally use white spirits, but you can get other paintbrush cleaners you just need to double check with either on the description at the back or with the store assistant that they clean enamel paint. Because if it doesn't clean enamel paint, you're effectively just wasting your money. And just go underneath the jaw, top jaw even. And pretty much there, I think. Now, one thing you don't want to do as well is completely hide all those black spots. Uh, basically what you're doing here is you are giving the impression of the skull having presence there but you don't want to lose that black undertone because that's what will help your skull pop out. So, that bit there as well. There we go. So, once you've got your skull done, you can then start doing fun part which is painting all the lava spots on. As you can probably see in the background there, I've already been busy doing that. So once you've got that done, like I say, let it thin out a little bit. 
and then you can start doing your yellow paint. So, oh, that's clean. There we go. Now, I personally prefer to go in the cracks and just kind of like emphasize those, but there is really nothing to say that you can go to town with this. Uh, there's no written rule of how to do positions for your lava. You have all the creative freedom in the world to choose how you want it to look. Um, I always try and think of spots in this as uh, if this was an actual lava flow, where would the lava travel? Where is it most likely to appear from? And when it does, how is it going to react? Is it going to react in a trickle or is it going to act as a eruption? So, although my paint design is one method, there is many, many, many methods you can do. And again, you're just finding all those points that you want that layer to go down. Now, if you look at photo references of lava, there's three main colours. You have white, which is for the white hot part which then descends down into yellow and then quickly translates into orange and eventually goes down to black which is the cooled lava. Now because the sculpt's so small I did try to do one with the white but the white was just not really that visible so I decided just to stick with yellow and then later on do oranges and blacks which I still think work out quite nicely and in fact with the prototype that's exactly what I did and uh, I don't think anyone's complained about it too much uh, so hopefully I'll start getting some feedback when these apps start going out to people because I think as yet I've still got about 70 odd to do I think and that's mainly down to the fact that as I said before because we've had cold weather I've not been able to get outside and spray a majority of these which is was the original plan when I did this last year for James I just had enough time to actually get most of them outside sprayed up with the primer and with the base coat so they could go out a lot quicker whereas this year we've just not really had the weather for it so it's been kind of a bit of a backlash but on top of that which has been a real big bonus in some greaties but uh, a bit of a an unforeseen circumstance on my part and that's mainly down to self-doubt. Um, I didn't expect people to actually buy the other designs. I was just expecting the fans to, you know, go crazy for the, for the toast magnets and uh, ignore the rest. But surprisingly enough, you uh, you all loved them, hence why you bought them. So I now have, well, excluding the stuff that just started selling again recently, I have about 250 magnets to go. Which again, as I say, I'm really grateful for those people that have made those purchases and that are happy to wait. And for those of you that have uh, messaged me asking where your orders are, you know, I'm hoping that the uh, this video might actually be able to answer a few questions for you. Um, but overall, I don't want people to think that you know I'm just taking this mo your money and running. You know, I am working as hard as I can for the amount of time that I've actually got. You know, I've got a master's degree that I'm now in the second year for and this will be the last year for my master so this is just as important as the uh, as the first year and uh, and I've got this uh, secret commission on the go as well which needs to be handed in by November which is very quickly looming up and I've only got one of the pictures done and I don't think I've got much um, leeway on it which is uh, frustrating, but I like a challenge. Do I like sleep just as much? So what I will be doing with these batches are uh, I will be making 10 of each, get them cast, sanded and painted as quickly as I possibly can, and then send them out. And for orders that have got multiple items in, especially multiple items of different uh, stone colours and everything. You might have to wait a little bit longer but again I will I'll try and get these out as quickly as I possibly can. I don't like making people wait for stuff that they've bought. 
but at the same time, you know, I'm, it's just me. You know, I've not got a team of people doing this. And it is literally just me. So I have to cast these, to sand these, to prime them, to paint them, and to varnish them as well. And it does take a lot of time. But I really didn't have any any self um, belief at all that you guys would have bought all this. So we've just got all the edges done. Get your toast lava sorted. So for this, because it's quite a thick piece, what you really want to do is have like a really slap on the lava. Uh, you want to spread it out as thickly as possible. And what will happen when it dries is that some parts will pool it together and then other parts will pool it quite thinly. Alright, so let's see. Just one more check before I put this down. No, I missed a bit. There should be a little spot there. There we go. So I think, for the moment, that will do. So, while you let that dry, depending on room temperature, it normally takes about anywhere between 12 to 24 hours. I prefer, when it's in thick pieces like this, especially with the, the lava toast segment, I prefer to do uh, 24 to 48 hours just to make sure that it's thoroughly dry. When the weather is actually quite warm, and I think the warmest we get it here in the northwest of the UK is normally about somewhere between 20 to 25 degrees, I normally leave it for about 12 hours. That will normally dry it out quite nicely. Um, but when it gets to weather like this and everything just becomes damp and cold weather and cold winds and all the rest of it, I just prefer to give it a little bit extra time just to make sure that when I get to the next stage of the painting process that it's not going to start bleeding into the paint. So, rather than waiting 24 hours for that one to dry, here's one I painted earlier. Uh, so as you can see, the pooling of the paint here is uh, solidified we haven't got too much black coming through which is good and then other areas this is all kind of white looks a bit messy but when you start putting the orange on it, it really starts bringing it to life and as for the skull as well as you can see uh, yeah it's just kind of like it's just all sitting on the top you don't have too much black sitting in there and uh, looks quite nice so far so next point after this it's always best to start on the skull first and then move on to the lava because that's where you'll need to start doing other bits and pieces to it. So, taking the medium sized brush again, we want to do a little trick, which is take a little bit of white, sort of dry brush it out, but then what you want to do is, because I'm using paint thinner here, you want to get it almost to a water base but you want to dry brush it off because then what you're going to do is you're going to just slightly coat it across and what it does is it diffuses the black on the skull to look more grey but then there's a trick that you can do with it afterwards I'm hoping you'll be able to tell because sometimes it can just be very subtle so, got that on, get a tiny bit of black, dry brush it off and then just stipple it across. So what you're doing is you're building up layers for the paint to make it look like char. So once you've got this on, what you then need to do is you need to go back with the white. And you don't start on the top jaw again, you start on the bottom jaw. And again, just get all those little gaps. And then get the black again, and just stipple it on. And then 
once you've got that, you hold back to the white. And this time, you don't have it with the paint thinner. Dry brush it off, and then just edge it along. So all these faint layers eventually build it up to a finished effect. Now, I'm going to try and get this looking complete because I don't really want to have a half finished piece. It is literally all dependent on opportunity. Sometimes there are days where you can do it and it will look perfect on the second go. And there are other days where you just constantly going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until eventually it starts looking how you want it. So, one more pass of the black I think. So again these black patches they don't need to be heavy, they just you just want it to be diffused want that charred look effect. And I think this is definitely going to be the last pass with the white. I think this is looking much better now. It's a shame I've not got the um, lighting behind me really because this would be really nice to show you from my perspective but fortunately I don't have any kind of uh, camera equipment to uh, to do that hopefully one day there we go yeah this is definitely the last pass I think anything beyond this is uh, it's gonna ruin it And there we go, so that's the skull done. Now we just need to do the rock. You want to be using orange, but you don't want to slap it on. You want to dry brush this on with the same brush. And you also want to uh, make sure that it's quite thin as well, because the yellow is gonna do most of the work for us with the orange but if it's thin then you can really make that yellow kind of do there we go. all that effort and also you want to make sure that you do the outer edge of that yellow as well Let's see if I can show you on this one. Actually, I'll do it on the toast actually. Um, yeah, so the, you want to do a dry brush of orange around the surrounding areas in yellow because what this does, it makes the rock look like it's got a heat source underneath it and that it's actually superheating the rock from underneath. And you want to be quite sporadic with it, you don't want to have it in a perfect circle or anything, you just want it to kind of make the, the yellow diffused. So again, you don't want it solid. If anyone's having trouble seeing this, in terms of it's uh, not 
good camera equipment or anything like that. If there's any experts out there that do this on a regular basis and know exactly the sort of equipment that I would need to do this properly, because I would like to make a semi-regular thing out of this, uh, then please, by all means, put a comment below and a link as well if, uh, if you know exactly where to get them from. Because although I can sculpt, I'm not exactly tech savvy, unfortunately. really just kind of like really go to town spread the orange around because what it'll do it'll diffuse into the black as well so unless you put it on quite thick in the first place um, it gives it a nice glow and that's all you really want to do with it really you just want to create that glow effect Okay, so now that we've come back full circle, this is the orange now, as it's uh, had time to dry. And as you can see, hopefully, um, it's dried a little bit more than what I personally would have preferred, but that's not a major problem because you've still got the spots of yellow that are coming through, which is what we want. Uh, but in some parts, it is still quite visible for the yellow, which is not what we want. So we just want to put a little bit more orange in places just to make it a bit darker. Uh, makes it look as if it's cooling down and further down it goes um, and another technique you can do as well is rather than just rubbing it straight off like I've been doing you can also stipple as well basically what a stipple will do which I'll do with the black but I'll tell you about it now uh, the stipple effect um, gives a scattered but more concentrated look at it as well so it's not as uh, it's not as pure dry brush and it'll look a little bit darker actually up here. There we go. Right, so now that you've got the orange on, clean your brush and you go back in with the black. Now we want to use the black at this point as sparingly as possible. You don't want to just slop it on there because uh, what you'll end up doing is you'll end up covering half of the paint that you've just done and then you can't really reverse back from that once you've done that. Dry brush it on ever so slightly, and this will give the illusion for the lava that's actually cooling down. So again, you, there's no real pattern to it; it's very sporadic. It happens where it happens, but it's entirely up to you where this would go. Uh, if anything, actually, the one thing to remember is that it will probably more likely congregate on the orange than it would the yellow, seeing as the yellow is the more heated variant. Now for the stippling as I was saying before, uh, what you want to do is this, so you just take the tip of your brush and you just basically just tap it on and it will give a spa, spatel, speckle, that's the word I'm looking for, look. Uh, but of course don't jab it in there because you'll break the actual tips of the uh, brush, but you also want to be fairly light with it, you don't want to completely uh, break it apart. Now I don't know if you can see, but as I'm painting, it's actually diffusing the edges of the yellow, so it makes it look like it's actually coming from within the rock rather than it's just basically sat upon it. I'll do a little bit more on that one actually because that's going to be a pool of lava. Come on, there we go.
beautiful. Perfect. So, once you've done this, then you can clean your brush and go and relax for a bit. <laughs> now, at this point, you can go over it again with the orange if you feel that the uh, the superheated rock isn't looking quite as warm as you prefer it to. Um, I think I might have to just dab a little bit more in the eye actually. Just to kind of show that it's coming through everywhere. Maybe around here as well. There we go. That's better. Gives it that more devil's lair look. So once you've done this section, again, you leave it to dry. Now because it's mostly dry brushing and thin layers of paint, it should take around about half the time that it did with the previous ones. So when it dries, you will have something like this. Now, again, when I was talking about the paints, you know, you can really go to town with ideas like here. I don't know if you can see it actually that well. Uh, let's see, yeah, it's right there, I think. Um, I've got the lava actually spilling over from the side of the toast and it's coming down the front. Uh, and in here, was it? No, it might be on another one actually. But yeah, this, the lava itself, you have no reason to say it has to stick within these points, you know. You might only want lava on maybe just one side of the magnet. Heck, you might even want lava in the actual eye sockets as well. It's entirely up to you. There's no reason that you can't paint this in any way that you feel more suited. Um, but hopefully the tips and techniques that I'm showing you will actually aid in you making something that you want to make. So, once it gets to this stage, this is when you can start applying your matte varnish. Now, I use enamel because it's quite a hard wearing paint, especially on small miniature models. But I also like to make sure it's sealed with a varnish as well. And the only reason I prefer to do that is because if you look at this one, there's a slight sheen on the quality of the paint. But when you use a matte varnish, it completely nullifies all that and it completely changes the color of the magnet as well. And in fact, if I show you the next stage, which is after it's been varnished, and I don't know how well you're going to be able to tell, but the slight sheens in... Actually, yeah, you can just about see where the toast edge is here. See how glossy that is. It's not a massive gloss, it's just a little bit of a sheen. And then you do the same thing in this area. And it's just flat. So the light is not reflecting off any surface whatsoever. And that is what you want. Ideally, in my preference anyway. I suppose there are probably a lot of people that would take this as they are and uh, apply them as is. So now we need to get our map varnish on. Now, I, as you can probably see, when this gets wet it does make the colours a little more vibrant, but trust me, once it dries, it will dry flat colours. Now the interesting thing to note as well is lava is not actually shiny, it's not glossy, it doesn't have a sheen, it is literally a flat colour. It's the only aspect of uh, lava that there is, is really it's the colour palette and that's kind of what gives you that effect that there's uh, more going on. So that's the thing you need to capture when you're doing the lava paint job, is you need to capture that fiery aspect. Now the other thing you don't want to do as well, you don't want to put it on too thick. Otherwise what will happen is it will mute the colours even more and make them more cloudy. So you want to make sure that if you're going to put a dollop on, that you really spread it out. 
vehicle for every nook and cranny. Right, so that's done. Allow that to dry. But normally, again, it takes somewhere between 12 to 24 hours to dry, depending on the room temperature. But when it dries, you'll get that. So you'll get a nice flat looking magnet. The colours aren't popping, at least they're not glossy, uh, and the lava effect is diffused. So it gives it that nice warm glow. If you're really lucky, your uh, paint job on the skull will actually pop out just as well, giving that burn ash sort of look. Now, it's been about 38 minutes for me to do this, and this normally applies to most paint jobs that I do, at least in terms of each phase. Like I say, you've got the first phase, which is paint, uh, the priming, then you've got the uh, the paint itself, uh, which for the base coat, and then depending on what level of uh, detail you need to do. You have to do the um, the dry brush for the stone, the dry brush for the skull, any kind of additionals with that and then so forth. One thing that, um, that I also want to point out as well is that when you're doing this on your own, if you have to do a batch of 10, you have to repeat this process every single time. So not every single paint job is going to look the same, but I also like to try and put variations in them so it's not the same technique that I'm doing time and time again makes it a bit more unique so that when you receive your item that it's something um, that's specific, bespoke specially to you. The only thing that I could probably say at this point as well is that because we're coming into the winter months as well you know things are going to slow down a little bit. Um, I, ideally I want to get these done before November at least for the for the toast stuff anyway. The other stuff I'm trying to get through as quickly as I can, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to do a batch of 10 of each one. So, for example, all the Jurassic Park designs, if you think, that there's, I think there's about 8 designs in total, I have to do 10 of each of those, so that's 80 magnets that I need to do. Um, and I'm trying to cast those as well, sand them up. Uh, I've got to cut the magnets out to put them on the back um, and prime those as well. So, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of work for one individual, and I'm, I'm happy to do it because I know that if you guys actually believe that this is something that you want in your lives then that I want to provide that for you and give you that joy that every time you go to your fridge or your desk space or whatever that you're always going to have this special magnet there but yeah it's, it's as long as people understand this takes a lot of time you know I could just turn around and say no I'm not doing this anymore and stop it and I don't want to do that because I know people enjoy it but hopefully these will be going to some very lucky people uh, at the end of the day I haven't numbered them yet I still need to number a few of them, but uh, but yeah, no. I hope that uh, this video has been some inspiration for you all. If there's any questions, uh, leave them down in the comments. I'm quite happy to talk about them, um, put you pointers on anything like that. Um, the other thing I will say as well is if you're of uh, an age where you're not using uh, uh, paints like these Humbrol enamels, then don't go out your way to try and find it. Um, for yourself, you know, just use what you can use. Like I say, you can use artist acrylics, and I think some um, some cheap shop paints. Um, I think like pound shops will do acrylic paints in there as well that you can use. And also, you won't have to prime them as well if you use acrylics. Acrylic bonds better to the resin than um, than anything else. But I always give these magnets out as um, primed now, so you don't have to worry about priming them for yourself. But anyway, I hope that's it. Uh, so that's a lava effect. I might have to redo this video again in the near future because like I said the lighting in here is not fantastic. It's a bit harsh, uh, but hopefully it might give you all something to uh, to have a try at. So yeah, 
if you end up doing something, you know, tag me on Twitter, Instagram, even. And yeah, I shall hopefully see you all in the near future. Thank you very much.